No, well, let's talk about Harry Grayson then, because uh, he's no longer with us. If you listen to the podcast again, you get a bonus uh, of me talking to him in 2009. Listen to how different that sound. It's weird. Uh, before I, you know, started hating people and stuff. Although there is some... <laughs> I remember, even though it's so long ago since I did this interview, I, I remember the only thing I edited out, because it was while I was at Ridings FM in Wakefield, which doesn't exist either now. He mentions Radio Leeds on it, so I edited that bit out. Because you can't mention the competition. When Chris Moyle sponsored the Featherstone Stadium, we never mentioned Chris Moyles. But Harry Grayson's died, which is very sad. Um, a, a fixture of local broadcasting in Yorkshire for donkey's years. Started on Radio Leeds, was a pioneer of some of their rugby league coverage. Look north, of course. Do you know who produced this half past five to six o'clock rugby league roundup show when that's all we had? Go on. Martin Kelm. Martin Kelm, never heard of it. Uh, <laughs> Not a columnist done all right for himself. <laughs> well, I mean, hopefully it's a long time until we're saying the same thing about Mr. Kelm, but it, it's very sad because obviously no one's had a bad word to say about him. Super League show, enjoy your rugby league and all that. Him and the Scoey on the sofas in the olden days. Uh, a, a titan of local broadcasting, the kind of which you don't get anymore. It was the, um, weirdly, in a Alanis Morissette not turning up for a gig because she was ill, ironic sense, the anniversary of Richard Whiteley's death this weekend as well. So two titans of, of local TV broadcasting, both with very different styles mm-hmm. and very different uh, ways of presenting things. Uh, which you don't get anymore. You don't get that same kind of... And it's not a knock on the people who, who do those programmes now. Right? Just You don't get that same longevity and... Which, which means you don't get that same association with the audience, that you're going in every night into their house and you become part of the family. I, I think he, his love of sport was indicated by whenever there was an Olympics on, Harry was always sent out to do Judah what you might call some of the lesser sports, but did them with such professionalism that you, I actually you know, found myself watching Taekwondo because Harry's commentated on it. Um, he was a, a lover of... He, he loved his cricket, he, he really did, um, but he, he absolutely was passionate about rugby league and where, wherever he could, sold the idea. To, to the extent that when Maurice Lindsay asked him to join um, to look after the, you know, the PR side, although it didn't work out because there was such diametrically opposed personalities. Um, Morris, obviously, in your face, have you done, what are we doing about? Harry, a bit more laid back. Um, it's safe to say that the, the, the styles were never going to work and I think Harry became a tiny bit disillusioned with the sport, went and worked for, was it TV South or something? He went to PBC in the South, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, after that. But the fact that he even wanted a position within rugby league because he could see that he could do so. the video that we've all got and watched thousands of times. Was it <laughs> of Bobby Fault? Uh, Dear me, he dealt with it well. He was perfectly professional. Um, you know, I, I happened to be there as one of the media people waiting to interview Bobby Fulton when Harry got to ask the first questions and Bobby just set on him. What do you know? And Harry was fantastic. Absolutely, that was that was at beloved Wakefield um, after Trinity had tried to rough up the tourists, <laughs> and uh, it developed into something of a, a bloodbath. And uh, and Harry merely asked of Bobby Fulton whether he was uh, going to condemn or condone the the behaviour of his players. What do you know about rugby league? But Harry was great, um, and he, he genuinely did care about the sport. He, he loved. I, I think he was more of a York City Knights fan than any other of the club he kept his allegiances very closely he lived uh, uh, in york for for, the, for a, a lot of the time that he was he was doing rugby league could often be seen having his little run on the on the race course waving at, at people and uh, just a genuinely ni- ni- nice guy and uh, so you, you need all the advocates you can get for for a sport like rugby league and within the case you know the space of two weeks we've lost two of them which is a terrible shame i think the you summed it up there uh, perfectly professional Hmm. Which it's not, not always e- a lot it's of not easy around. to do when you've got people talking in your ear and you got to remember that what you're actually saying to the camera and the script and a running order and timings and I have to say as well that uh, he was very good to us when we launched Forty Twenty. Um, they had us in on Look North um, on the sofa and he was genuinely interested about 
why would you want to start a magazine? What is it trying to be? And and he, you know, when he when he wished you good luck with the venture, you knew that he really meant it. And um, yeah, d didn't know him that well, but I, as you say, not just a um, someone who will be fondly remembered in a local sense. But I think he, you know, he used to go and do grandstand as well. Perhaps over the, over the Christmas period, I think when they were uh, moving their presenters around, he. Yeah, he advocated for rugby league on a national scale. He wasn't just a, a great local broadcaster. You'll hear in the interview just how professional he is faced with uh, some idiot from local commercial radio turning up to interview. But that, that comes up after you'll hear from uh, James Simpson and Tom Halliwell. We'll be back at some point next week. I'm not exactly sure when, um, talking some rugby league. And, well, in, 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 the, in the words of Harry, enjoy your rugby league. Pause. But then, Harry, how difficult is it to narrow everyone that's ever played sport from Yorkshire into 30 people? Well, I'll tell you something, Richard, it was a real um, difficult selection in the end because I've gone from 1 to 30 um, and I've done them in the order that I think I regard them as my true sporting heroes. So I could have, I had an initial list on the top of my head of about 100 and I've culled that to 30. Uh, and I've tried to make it a cross-section of sports, and I've also tried to have a story about each of them. That was the criteria for me, that I had some kind of connection with them, whether it was from Look North, Radio Leeds, or Grandstand, and, and that was the basis of my, my selection process. Now, how many, were there any difficult situations where any players who, uh, or sportsmen who just about crept in, or ones that you missed out with thought? Yeah, definitely. There, there were a couple of difficult decisions to make, actually. Uh, my passion is cricket, um, I love my rugby league as well, as you probably know, and I love my football. Um, so they were the three main sports that had to sort of uh, take a pride of place. But there are other sports I've covered as well, of course, and I've gone back to swimming and Eta Lonsborough, uh, and uh, uh, also um, I've looked at uh, one or two other sports as well, like Peter Elliott in athletics. Um, in the rugby league side, there were lots of people who could have so easily got onto the list, you know, people like Alan Hardesty. Um, but in the end, I had to be fairly ruthless, and I've gone on those that I've a story to tell about, and that's what m made me look at it very, very critically in that regard. We were sat here at Eddie, only overlooking oh. the cricket ground, there's the, the rugby ground to the side of us. You could probably have done 30 cricketers and 30 rugby league Easy, players. easy, easy. I mean, just look around you, Richard, if you get the chance today before the launch actually starts, and you'll just see this is the legend suite. I mean, the history that's uh, on the photographs here is just phenomenal. You're overlooking the best test arena in the world for me with a new stand going up it's a beautiful day uh, and it's like being in paradise I can imagine that uh, that would be like that if I ever got up there <laughs> <laughs> this is quite awe-inspiring now who were the people who first got you hooked into the world of sport well, well strangely I, I suppose really I go back to my school I went to school in York and my cricket coach there was a guy called David Kirby he he sort of cemented my passion for cricket which has always been my number one sport um, but also, I suppose, too, when I look at the broadcasting side of things as well, when I first started broadcasting at Radio Leeds, um, I had to um, uh, cover Rugby League, which I'd never covered before, and that became a passion as well. So uh, all kinds of things uh, were developed in that regard. Did you get thrown in the deep end sometimes? Yeah. When I started, uh, well, not too long ago now, but I, uh, we had in Wakefield a rugby union club, which we don't have anymore, and my background was in Rugby League, so that was uh, quite interesting trying to commentate on rugby union without having much of an idea of what was going on but it's a, a great challenge but well you know what it's like you know for ridings you're exactly the same as i was you know you are yes you like to specialize but the reality is you've got to cover other sports there's there's, there's a good chance you some point you have to do a hockey item you know wakefield has got a great hockey club there as well so that's the way we do and, and you develop and then your interest develops as a result of it i mean rugby league became a real passion of mine still is i love the the game i present, still present, uh, present the super league show as well um but you're a jack of all trades and I, i've covered ridiculous sports i've covered i covered tiddlywinks once <laughs> for the oxford and cambridge um uh, sports extravaganza for grandstand. I did it for grandstand. I've covered judo. I've covered wrestling. Um, I, I've covered archery. Uh, I've done commentaries on on these things all around the world. So, you know, I, I don't pr proclaim to be an expert, but for a moment in time, you are. 
It's the, the element of uh, convincing people that you're an expert when they're... Convin- exactly. <laughs> You've got out the good pattern, Richard, which I'm sure you have. <laughs> um, if you look, uh, if you had to write this book again in 30 years' mm. time, is anyone around today who you think could, could get into another book? Oh, definitely. I mean, I would now turn around to you and say that th- th- these are all heroes that have all stopped playing. That, that's, the, that's the key to it. And some, sadly, have stopped playing, but are, are playing up in that great uh, playground in the sky at the moment. Um, so that, that, it, that was the criteria for this one. Yeah, I mean, I could do a modern one. And the person who I spring to mind now, I think he's going to be an absolute superstar, is Jessica Ennis, I think, the world athlete champion. She's got everything. She's a beautiful-looking uh, girl. She's got so much style and class. And she's going to be a world star. She really is. She's a fantastic person as well. Especially being from Sheffield and the sports personality of the year has been uh, well, in Sheffield. I mean, so we're voting. Thing. We're pushing like that bird <laughs> to win it. I hope she does. Yeah, I, I think she's one of the outstanding candidates this year. Oh, definitely, I yeah, yeah. I think if you look at the other sports uh, men that get put forward to a sportsman, of course, uh, you look at the Jensen Buttons and these people, but they all have uh, amazing technological help where it's her on yeah. her own, really. So the physicality of it, I mean, I suppose if Andy Murray had won something, he would definitely be knocking on the door, but he's not there yet, and he's young, and he will win something. He's going to win a major at some point, so uh, he, he'll be he'll be down the, the line a little bit. Uh, the only other contenders are usually footballers but there's been no great football so Jessica for me is is the outstanding candidate at the moment she's the one to beat if we look if we look back then at these people who was the, the main people who stick out when you've written this book well I, I've done it in order I've done it from 1 to 30 and uh, I, I can remember Bill Bridge of the Yorkshire Post said to me I bet boycott's number one everyone knows I'm a great fan of Geoffrey he isn't it's John Charles the uh, great Legion United player uh, I never saw him play in his pomp but when you get people like Jack Charlton and Bobby Charlton saying this was the greatest player they'd ever seen, I think you've got something special there. And he was such a lovely man as well. And uh, you know, he ran out of money at the end. And uh, it was a very sad way because this guy would have been just a god in this day and age. He would have been able to play. Imagine the ball comes over, you're heading a cannonball because that's what they were like in those days. They were just not like the soft ones now. He'd, he'd have scored. 10 times the amount of goals because they, it would have knocked your census with that ball when you headed it. So he was he was a great one. I'm also rather surprised, Boycott's number two, I put Brian Close at number three because I think Brian Close has been one of the most uh, undermentioned of uh, cricketers of all time. He, he, he was here at Headingley where he managed to get together the most grumpy set of Yorkshire folk and make them into an absolutely astonishing cricket team. How do you keep peace with Freddie Truman, Geoffrey Boycott, Ray Ellingworth, some of those characters there? Um, and it's great to be able to uh, to be here to, to reflect on Brian Close. Obviously, others popped to mind. Freddie Truman, great guy as well, and uh, he was my hero of a fast bowler because I used to think I was a fast bowler, but he was my uh, hero in terms of athleticism. I guess the advantage the uh, the legends of the past have. Is that unlike, say, Darren Goffel or someone today who's every moment is captured on film? These people are mm. mostly only remembered in uh, in the memories of people who mm. actually watch them. So over time, I know uh, certainly to me the the great Wakefield team of the sixties has been uh, yeah. uh, their, their story has been told to me uh, time and time again, and their legend grows and grows as the years go by. It's an advantage the people of the past have over over the people of today. Uh, yeah, no, no doubt about that. I mean, Neil Fox is one of my heroes. He's here today. Uh, Don Fox, sadly, is not no longer with us, but his family are coming here today as well. Um, and, you know, th- these are people who, again, y- you're talking about kicking a football, kicking a rugby ball. Well, the technology now is such that those balls are easy to kick. You've still got a skill to get your know, goals, etc. But the ones that Neil Fox kicked were, again, like kicking you know, a, a solid a mound of rock when they got wet and his skill was a, an astonishing one he was a great great player was Neil Fox he did so much for Wakefield Trinity um, and I, I just I'm so chuffed that he's coming today as well who were the people or, or would you like to name any of the people who just missed out who you, you yeah I, I didn't miss them yeah I didn't put in Seb Coe um, uh, who's obviously got a very strong Yorkshire connection but I didn't think his connection with Sheffield was quite as uh, as significant as uh, uh, as should have been. Uh, I mentioned to you before about Alan Hardiston, people like that. Um, there were quite a few uh, other great rugby league players that uh, could so easily uh, have got in as well. 
Uh, and the selection process in the end was was just done on that basis. I've said to you before, it was based on my e experiences. But uh, I suppose I could have looked at uh, a few more footballers as well. I could have looked at someone like Peter Lorimer. I've always had a high regard for um, nice chap. Um, and um, I also have a, a a real regard for Stuart McCall of Bradford City as well because I think he. Um, distinguished himself during the Bradford City fire and has come back and is doing a great job with, there with Bradford City at the moment. He's doing it the right way as well, starting yeah. down to the bottom. Exactly, as well. exactly. Nice yes. guy, nice guy. Uh, if we look then uh, at the, the way things are at the moment with Yorkshire just avoided relegation, uh, hopefully things are looking good for them. They've got some good young players coming oh, yeah. through as well. They have fantastic players. Um, there's a real excitement about here. Um, funny enough, I don't think relegation would have been the end of the world because the Yorkshire public would have been annoyed but the reality is that the same people would have come to support them year after year. Uh, there's still a hard core of two, two and a half thousand who watch county championship cricket wherever Yorkshire play and always will do. But there is a buzz about this place at the moment and a, and a relief that they haven't gone down but look at who they've got. You know, they've got fast bowler, this double barrel name was in um, something Dolby isn't it, Harrison Dolby, whatever. They've got Johnny Bairstow, what a player he's going to be. I mean, I, I eulogise about him and Boykes told me the other day this lad's going to play for England inside the next two years. I think he'll be playing for them next year. I think he's got so much talent. We've got It'll be a, a great tribute to his father as well. Ah, oh, great. Yeah, but I, I think he's better than his dad. And his dad's one of my heroes. But I think Johnny's a better player. He's a better batter, certainly. Much better batsman. And I'm told he's a better he's a better wicket keeper as well. And he's got such a lovely mum who's supported him and a lovely sister as well. No, they're, they're great. Uh, the, 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 he's a great lad, is Johnny, and I'm going to really push him as, as much as I can, <laughs> Richard. I'll tell you. Certainly, we need a, a, a wicketkeeper who can uh, stay in the team. It's just something that they keep chopping and changing. Well, they don't give they don't give him a chance at wicketkeeper, uh, and I I, I I don't know why that is. I mean, they've obviously got a couple of talented wicketkeepers themselves, but uh, there is a feeling that I know it sounds strange that the wicketkeeping role is not that important uh, in one sense. Uh, it used to be key, you know, when you look at David Bairstow and you look at Jimmy Binks before uh, before him. Um, he was one that nearly got in as well, Jimmy Binks, by the way. Um, so you, you look at all these people and you think, well, yeah, they're, they're good. And the weak keeping role in county championship cricket doesn't seem to be as key as it is, strangely, in one day when you've got to be really on the top of your game. And then in rugby league, Yorkshire dominating the Super League, which is always good to see, and Leeds yeah. going for a third successive title this week. I can't see anybody beating Leeds. Um, um, certainly can't see St Helens doing it. Um, I think they've got the hex on them when it comes to finals. The only way St Helens can probably rattle Leeds is, I, I did see a sign that I thought St Helens defence was a lot better against Wigan than it has been in recent weeks, if they've got that part of the game together. But my theory is this, yes, Catalan bashed up Leeds a bit, but I think Wigan bashed up St Helens more and I think Leeds will take advantage in that regard. I think that was a great decision putting those two teams together. I don't know if, I, I don't know if that was the theory or whether they just wanted Catalans, but that was uh, a fantastic game. I, I think it, you know it was a no, it was a no brainer for me. You know, if you've got a prospect of Saints against Wigan, which is probably the fiercest rugby league derby of all, um, you, you've got to put them together and hope that they come out walking on splints at the end of it. And that's probably what happened, really. And we've got Wakefield's Academy just winning the championship. Which yeah, good yeah. I mean, it's good to see the youth, hopefully more youth players coming through, especially with the uh, the quarter system change. Although I can't get my head around the rules necessarily, but it'd be good to see an England or Great Britain or however we play a team be able to compete against the Australians time and time again because it's yeah. something that I've never seen. Yeah, well, we, 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 it's, a, it's a kind of football situation, isn't it? When you look at it. Um, too many Australians playing in the game over here, in my opinion. I've, I've never um, gone on any other decision other than that. And the same is there's too many international stars playing in the Premiership. Uh, Wakefield do a great job. And I have to say, you know, if anybody has my admiration as a coach, it's John Keir. He's a great guy, is John Keir. And the club is a great club. And I'll tell you why it's a great club. It's had to cope with two tragedies in the last year. And it has coped with distinction, with integrity. And everybody at that rugby club deserves to be appreciated because they are they do a great job with the limited resources, let's be honest. You know, they can't compete with the big guys, but they do a good job and they've got a top guy at the uh, top there with John Keir. And it's good to see what well, Castlewood getting into the playoffs as well and Featherson just missing out. And Castlewood, yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, the biggest question that they've got to, of course, decide on is um, uh, both clubs, you know, about new grounds and whatnot. I don't know how far 
down the road they are. Uh, there's even a suggestion, is there not, of sharing, but I'm not going to go down that there, because <laughs> that would probably get me lynched. <laughs> <laughs> it's a bit of a hot potato, that one, it's, uh, it certainly is. Just, just going back to the, the book again, finally, if there was one person you could you could watch again, or one uh, a group of people in a team, who would it be and, and why? I, I would like to go and watch the Yorkshire cricket team in their pomp during the 60s. Um, really watch them play again together and I'd like them to play that team I'd like them to play the current yeah. county champions and they would annihilate them they would annihilate them on uncovered pictures or the pictures of any pictures any, picture. any pictures they would annihilate them they just look at look at the strength of that that side from all the way down the line you know oh what a team that was and uh, uh, I just love to see it. I just love to see the rest of them grow. I guess when people read this book, there's going to cause some arguments. I hope so. Not I hope so. I hope, the, I hope the argument is, you know, uh, oh, that's a strange choice or that's a controversial choice and so on and so forth. But that's what I've done it for. A bit of debates, a bit of uh, bit of fun as well. Um, it also covers some of the favourite grounds that I've uh, I've been to. Some of them have gone, um, like Bramall Lane Cricket, Park Avenue, Bradford. Uh, where I first watched my sport and I've also covered in the book uh, some of the sports that still go on in Yorkshire but nowhere else so I've tried to cover quite a few things. It's been such good fun, I've really enjoyed it. I can imagine some of the old grounds, I mean you look at Bellevue now and it's, uh, <laughs> it's not changed much in uh, No, and, and you know, <laughs> and it needs to, it yeah. needs to in the, in the, in the context of, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> it needs to change in the context of uh, Super League because they want the all the grounds to be on a similar standard but I always think the same. When I go to Castleford, I think that's a rugby league ground for me. You know, when I go to Hull FC, KC, I love the ground, but it's a football ground, isn't it, initially? Um, and so that's why I'm, I'm a great believer in uh, trying to get the keep the traditions strong and stick in the heartland and try and keep the grounds to reflect what the sport's all about. Yeah, somehow building a new stadium without it being a, a soulless box. Well, it, it, many of them are. You look at football grounds now, you go to Derby County, you go to Darlington, you go to Bolton, they're all the same. Um, yes, they're comfortable, yes, they're good to watch, but oh, and I'd rather have something with a bit of character, a bit of personality. Yeah, nothing beats getting wet at uh, Bellevue. I'm not sure about that. <laughs> I, got, I, I, I used to get absolutely soaked. I mean, my, when I first started my radio days, uh, we used to have a, a, a trek around the grounds to do, used to do on a Thursday night, I used to start off at Castleford, used to go on to Wakefield, then I used to go, no, so it's Castleford, Featherston, Wakefield, and then if I'd got time, I used to head home and do Dewsbury. That was my Friday night, uh, Thursday night uh, roundup for the rugby league programmes over the weekend. Great fun, great time. Better now in the summer than it will be in the winter. I don't know, <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I'm sure, easy to, easier to cover, but of course the other side of things now is that when I, when I was you know, first started in broadcasting, we, we used to go and meet these people. You know, we didn't do it on telephone. Most of them do it on telephones and ISDN kits and whatnot now. We used to meet them face to face. That's where we got the stories. That's the difference. Mm. Harry, thank you very much. Lovely. Nice to see you.